Welcome to Eagle Eyed, I'm Bill Baker. Today features part one of my interview with Christian Osberg. We cover his rise from Texas High School Rugby to French Pro D2 Club Oriac, including stops along the way at Life University in Georgia, Italian Rugby, and his U20 experiences with USA. Part two later this week, we'll get into his downfall with the Oriac, including a nasty leg injury, his long recovery from it, and his fresh restart with MLR's Austin Gilbronis. Hope you enjoy. Hey, Christian, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, man. Nice Atlanta Braves hat you have on there. I oh, appreciate it. Christian, first off, um, I know you've been back for a little bit, but uh, welcome back to the States. Thank you. How's it feel to be back on Texas soil? Uh, it's a little weird, a little crazy, but uh, happy to be back, yeah. I'd like to get a, a sense of your growth, your route from you know, high school to you know, all the way professional in Europe and then back here yeah. as well. Um, so I remember starting like my freshman year in school and at the time it was obviously you got football in Texas already a big deal but at that time specifically my high school was uh, already doing really well I think we were for about three years straight we were going to the state semifinals and so growing up you're just wanting to be a part of that but at the same time I'm hearing that you had a teacher just wanting to he kind of had a they call it the rugby club it was considered like chess club almost and was just really wanting to grow the game somehow in an area at the time. It was, what, 2008, 2009, where, I mean, rugby at the time wasn't a big deal at all in uh, schools. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll give it a try. It might help with football and the contact and all that Mm -hmm. in the offseason. And after one year, I was hooked. I didn't really take it too serious, but I was already hooked. And um, it ended up being the last three years of high school, I was doing football, to help with the rugby and yeah. uh, rugby became priority after that. I was always just that big kid. And as soon as I started playing rugby, that's when the athletic ability started kicking in. I started figuring out what I could do with a ball and then knowing that I could also hit people. I wasn't just known as the big guy who needed to block or go hit someone in football. I could do it all and I was allowed to do it all. And as any player at that age, just figuring out your body, figuring out everything, it just sort of gives you the confidence you need to just kind of see where it goes. How did that whole transition work from your high school game to Life University? When I was doing high-performance stuff with the Texas All-Star team uh, and getting looked at when I went to uh, Colorado for the Rocky Mountain Challenge, went there three times and got uh, All-Tournament twice. And um, so that was kind of how I was getting my name out. And through that, I helped me get selected for the high school All-Americans. And pretty much once you're on that list, you know, you start getting looked at and talked to by colleges. So pretty quickly I got on, uh, at the time it was Dan Payne was still there. Right. Um, and uh, I also had my high school coach had went to Life University back in the day when they still had the Super League and things like that. So oh, yeah. uh, he was always really kind of pushing that in the chiropractic side. And Dan had kind of heard a little bit about me. And we met once and we just stayed in contact. And um, within a few months or so, you know, I was getting the, the uh, scholarship offer. So that that's great. Good. Now, who was your high school coach? Uh, Paul McCartney, everyone around here in the area knows him as Coach Rock. I think he sort of changed the way I might have thought about rugby, really. I mean, yeah. uh, I remember he was at first, when I first started playing those first two years, he was more like the assistant coach who would come in a couple times during the week. And we just knew when he's coming in, he was health, fitness, chiropractic, and he was just, he was going to kick our butt every time yeah. he was coming to practice. <laughs> so when he, he finally took it, fully over my junior year and that's when everything sort of really just took off uh, right. for me and for the art of rugby in general and now it's turned into it's not just a high school thing anymore in the area it's a multi-school sort of thing and he's taken everyone to sevens tournaments all across the country he's they're well known i'm pretty sure throughout yeah. uh, the country now with high school rugby so he's really done a lot so um life you were there for a couple of years I was there for a couple of years. Correct, right, right. And that, that, that professional atmosphere there at life got you to your next phase. So at this mm-hmm. point, I read that you, you hired an agent. Now, how did that work? It's not like there's a bunch of rugby no, agents going around the country. Not at all. Uh, so that kicked off from my freshman year. Um, my freshman year at life was pretty crazy. Uh, I was one of the few guys who was even playing varsity my freshman year. And about midway through the season, I got a serious injury and I broke my jaw. And that was a long process of coming back because that was a very mental thing, too, because, you know, no no extremities are injured. Nothing's actually like you can still physically do everything. Right. You just can't eat. I was wired (laughs) shut. So like I would try and train with everybody 
and I would just lose a bunch of weight, and I was mal- I was wired shut for about two months. The day I got cleared to play, I actually got a text from Scott Lawrence being like, are you cleared? I was like, yeah, by the way, I actually am. He's like, great, I want to throw you into one, – one U20 guy just got injured in second row, and I want to throw you into contention for that. I was like, uh. oh. He's like, I was like, when's this? He's like, next week. I was like, okay, <laughs> even better. So wow. my first bit of rugby was with the U20s. And fast forward to that, I made the U20s. We went to the Junior World Cup there in, in France and played well enough that I got looked at by agents that way. Wait, wait, hold on. Had, Let's just back up a second. So you're injured for a while. You're able to work out, yeah. but no real yeah. rugby activity. No. And, and if I remember correctly, this was uh, like spring box, right? You, you yeah, played so your very, first game back so, as a baby box. <laughs> yeah, so my first game back from breaking my jaw, uh, first bit of rugby at all was playing against the reigning world champions, the baby box, and Jeez. played for 80 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean, we got pumped. I mean, it was 100 yeah. to nothing. And it was kind of throughout, I guess there was little things agents were saying, and I was one of maybe the taller, bigger guys on the team. And so some agents contacted me. Um, okay. Just and I didn't really. I was like, "What's this about?" You know, I kind of had some questions, but I I kind of pushed them off to the side. I was like, "I want to focus on school. I want to do whatever." And so I get to my sophomore year of life, and I because there was that rush from the broken jaw and mm-hmm. jumping into the U twenties mentally, I was off. Oh. And Dan gave me so many opportunities that sophomore year for me to do well and to thrive, and I shot myself in the foot. I would play. I was a part of every. 23 that was playing every weekend and i would be doing well 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 well. so then i get to the point of i need to, if i do well at this point i've got the starting job or i've got the chance to play or i've got to this i got to that and i would know that and i would psych myself out it was all mental you know that sophomore year uh, yeah. off the pitch on the pitch was a very tough year for me when i ended up contacting these agents back that summer ended up going back uh, to school for that summer quarter, did a few classes, and um, got about halfway through, and I got a uh, contract. I got multiple contract offers during that time from multiple agents. I actually got a an academy contract from France, but I had no idea what it was. So I ended up taking <laughs> uh, the first one that was offered, which looked good, uh, and that was to go to Italy and play in like the uh, third division, fourth division right. over there. And I mostly took that just for the opportunity. I knew I was going to play. Right. And I was like, this is going to be better than where I was at. I need a restart. I need a refresh. And I remember going in and telling Dan this, feeling nervous. But at the same time, he understood. And I told him, I was like, I'm only going to be gone for like eight months. And then I'm planning on coming back. I was like, this is a restart. (laughs) And I'm going to come back. And I plan on coming back for you. And he was like, all right, I hope you do well. And it was kind of just left off at that. Then obviously now fast forward a little bit and. Yeah. I never went back. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and it ended up working out a lot better than I expected. So, so you with the Italian team for just a few months, right? I was there for like six months. Okay. Uh, I had signed for the full season. The full season was like eight months, eight gotcha. nine months, and I had some, uh, but I was only there for six, and that was pretty funny. I'd never been to Italy, so <laughs> the place where I was living was insane. It was a island on the west coast, right on the beach. Wow. It was like you had rugby pitch, you had road, you had the beach. I mean, it was insane. <laughs> I mean, it was almost like I was just on vacation for a while. So, sorry, and, I, I don't want to rush through this at all because, I mean, this is important. Um, so, you're in Italy for eight months, mm-hmm. and then you go over to uh, Chinner. Well, I was in Chinner just to finish off the season, so I was only there for like three months. I got brought over with a connection that my agent, or the agent I was using at the time, had with an Italian agent who was helping out Algaro, the team I was at in Italy, to help, kind of helping them out on the side. The coach that was in England at Chinner they kind of got into a second row situation and due to injuries and he contacted this Italian agent. He's like, well, by the way, I actually have somebody. They, uh, I got contacted by this England coach and he was just, we need you. When can you get here? Within a week, I was able to switch at, uh, from the Italian Rugby Federation to the RFU and I landed on a Friday. Everything started from that Tuesday and I was on the bench on Saturday in less than 24 hours of being in the country and they were yeah. like, we hope you can play well. We've never seen you play at all, so let's. We hope this goes well. And that was the first time I was on the bench, and then I ended up. I started every match after that. So, what was the salary like for those two stops right there? Well, it wasn't a lot. No, <laughs> it wasn't a lot. But I mean, it wasn't bad. You know, it was. 
we gave you they gave me an apartment they gave me a car that i could share with one of the guys and it was like here's a thousand euros under the table wow so i would just go and cash it out at the bank and yep. had a thousand bucks to deal with for the week and so i was just paying for groceries i wasn't doing anything else so yeah it wasn't bad Especially living yeah. five minutes from the beach. I was like, I'll take that. And then <laughs> yeah. at 20 years old, I had just turned 20 when I signed that contract. So I was like, this is perfect. Yeah. I'll take it. And um, and when I got over to England, it was, um, for them, it was a big deal because they were really trying to get promoted up. So they were, I mean, they had all the guys kind of housed together and it was a nice place. But in my head, I knew, I was like, hey, if I'm going to Italy and I'm starting out this low, um, I could maybe progress up within yeah. a certain amount of years. And it was the same thing. And then I was like, hey, England's a better opportunity. I knew the rugby was going to be better. Right. Uh, so I was like, same thing. I get over there. I need a few years and I'll work my way up. But by the time I was getting over there, I was already speaking with uh, the coach over in France because he had already heard a lot about me. The You don't hear kind of what I did a lot. No one just <laughs> gets up and leaves, um, no. especially at Life University at that time. It made a lot of noise. And I know a lot. I remember a lot of articles were kind of coming out about it. And through that, the Oriac coach was able to hear about me. Wow. And uh, uh, yeah, he sent me like a Facebook message and was just like, I didn't know any <laughs> other way to get a hold of you. Is there any way we can talk? So. And now this is a big jump, right? Oh, Nationally massive to, to Oriac. So you, you signed, I think you signed a two year deal off the top and you come into camp. Now explain that atmosphere in camp. So when I first went over there, it was an, just an academy contract, but I was allowed to train with the, uh, with the pros the entire time. Um, and the coach that was there at the time was a guy named Jeremy Davidson. You know, he was asking me, what are you confident in? What do you, what do you know you're good at? And I was like, oh, my line outs. I'm confident in my line outs. He was like, great, let's see how they are. And I remember yeah. my first bit of line outs, it was so bad. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing? Like, how are you jumping like this? Everything's so inconsistent. So I, I started to rebuild myself and rebuild everything. I had to learn how to do everything all over again. It was a long, hard way, but that first year, like, uh, he knew kind of where I was coming from. He's like, let's just take our time that first year and just use it as like a developmental year. You'll train with the first team the whole time. You'll train with us, the pros. But then I was lucky enough there towards the end of the season that I was able to get a little bit of playing time. Good. And uh, I had worked my way up. And that was also an awesome year, too, to that we had made it all the way up to the uh, the Pro D2 final and almost got promoted up to top 14. Right, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. you were really close. Yeah, so to have been a part of that, those last few matches to help us get to that point and everything like that was really cool. And uh, I even almost got a chance to play in the final. So the, the most important question here about your time during Oriac is the scrum cap. Where would that come from? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just like to represent where I'm from. I actually had gotten it from a long time before when I was in Italy. I was just too nervous to ever bring it out. And finally, <laughs> I was just like, because you hear the stereotypes, you know, of those especially like in France and Italy and stuff like yeah. that. But like, you know, they don't like Americans too much or whatever. And I remember showing them in training, like, what do you think about this? They're like, that is awesome. Why <laughs> had you not brought that out before? We love that. So I wore it a couple of times in Italy yeah. and it almost is like, like a bad juju thing. If I didn't wear it, I was like, right. because things started happening in games where I was like, that's never happened before. And I just kind of kept rolling with it. And it became sort of like a big identity thing once I got over to France. Right. Everyone just knew me as that. So anytime I play in a match, you would hear, I, I remember my, my parents had a way of being able to watch my matches and uh, you could hear them when they would start talking about me. Anytime I come on, it became a really, really big and kind of cool thing. So 